So Matt and Tony, two troublemakers. <laughs> also two folks, two people who've known each other for a very, very long time. So as you heard, Matt, uh, CEO of Automatic and WordPress, and Tony has been with True Ventures uh, and founder of About.me. So you guys have such an interesting story because you guys met a very, very long time ago when Matt was like 19 years old. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think it's important we talk about mentorship and investment when it comes to having a, a, a good company. So can you just explain how you met Tony? Oh, wow. It was, uh, it was very long ago. <laughs> I think I feel like we should get cozier. <laughs> when uh, Matt met Tony. Uh, there was a journalist. There is a journalist named uh, Om Malik and, um, of Giga Om. And he was one of the earliest users of WordPress. And I think he was doing a story on another company you had invested in. Yeah, Oddpost. Oddpost. So around Oddpost, and he, uh, both Tony Schneider, who later <laughs> became CEO of Automatic, and introduced me to Tony Conrad. And uh, I think we had a phone call. I was in Houston, Texas, and I didn't want you to know I was in my car. So I turned the car off. But as you know, coming from the <laughs> south, it gets very hot. And so the car had started to get really, really, I didn't have reception in my apartment. So I was like in this sweltering heart call on this phone call. And I think Tony thought we were a company. So you're like, how much revenue do you have? How many employees? And the answer was none and none. <laughs> but it ended up working out. And, and you ended up investing and in becoming a board member. You've been a board member now for nine years, right? Yeah, nine and a half. What was it in Matt and the company and this you know, crazy kid in college who had this idea of blogging? And you know, what was it that really attracted you to the idea of Matt and this company? Yeah, I, th I think, it, well, I'll start off by saying I think my relationship with Matt is probably, for me, and I have hopefully a good relationship with all the, the founders I work with, but it's probably been one of the most rich ones for me and probably the most important in a lot of ways. Um, so the, the thing that blew me away about Matt was that he was honestly thinking about the web as we're using it today, and this was, you know, 10, 11, you know, 10, 10 and a half, 11 years ago. And, I mean, he was showing me pictures, um, <laughs> you know, off of his computer, but in the cloud. <laughs> I know that sounds funny, but, but at the time, like, we didn't, we didn't have Instagram. We didn't really have shared photography. We didn't have these things. Interactivity around uh, commenting on blog posts and things like this. And, it kind of blew my mind. And I remember I said to my wife, uh, I had the most extraordinary conversation with a young founder. I had no idea he was only 19, but I just remember saying, like, uh, this, this, he's a pretty special guy. And, uh, you know, our relationship has evolved in a lot of great ways since then. And as I said, you've been on the board for a very long time. You just became the CEO uh, back in January of, of Automatic, which is the parent company of WordPress. So that was, a, that was a, a very big deal, especially for you, kind of having built out this for a very long time. You know, what is the most surprising thing about becoming the CEO? Oh, my goodness. Uh, <laughs> every th it's been a, very much a learning experience. For better or worse, I'm learning something new every day. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first things that I realized is that, uh, you know, Automatic hadn't raised any capital since 2008. We'd only had about maybe $11 million, $12 million of primary capital into the company for the first eight years. And um, I realized that was something I was advocating for pretty strongly because uh, we were growing, we were bootstrapping, we were sort of growing on revenues. But I realized there was a lot of opportunity cost. So there were certain things we weren't doing um, because they would cost too much capital, it would be too much outlay. And so that was why just a few months after uh, I took over the role, we decided to raise some money. And so now that you've raised the money, and it, it, the, the interesting thing about WordPress, and even reading about WordPress, is it's such a different company than some of the larger tech companies that have been around. Everything that you do is just different with your company. <laughs> I mean, not in, a, not in a bad way, but you raised money at a later time. You kept it smaller. There's a different company culture. What, can, you, can you just explain a little bit about why WordPress is different and, and why you chose to go that route? Well, a lot of what we do is, is sort of going back to first principles, like how, not doing it because someone else has done it, but why should something work? Like how, if I wanted to work from the pool, for example, like how can I do that? How can I be wherever I want? Um, so creating the company that I wanted to work at also created a company that other people wanted to work at. And we just try to always um, go back to those. You know, but I think that's an important thing to do in anything that you build. And I know there's a lot of founders in the audience. Like, uh, don't just 
do the what or say, you know, some entrepreneur does something, so I should do it that way. Think of the why. And if you can really, if you keep asking why, you eventually get to the thing that is the core reason and follow from that. And you guys are both, you're about that, me too, you know, both of these companies are companies that are built on the idea of brand identity and, you know, having your own voice. Um, can you explain to me a little bit about how that applies to about.me? Um, in terms of having your own voice? or Yeah, <laughs> when it comes to having your own voice and having your own brand. I mean, in this new digital era where a, a paper yeah. resume, handing it to someone feels a little bit weird. At this so, point. yeah, I think, I think one of the things that we all are realizing is that more and more of our first impressions and our first interactions with people are happening online. And it's only going to accelerate, yeah. right? It's not going to decelerate. And so the question really is, what is your public profile? And that's, that's the thing that we've been, you know, obsessed in, with and in, in trying to solve for. Um, what is the information that I want to give somebody when I'm making a first impression? And so there are lots, I think all of us think we have profiles out there that are public, and they are in a certain degree, but they're not. So our Facebook pages are very much private graph. Our LinkedIn pages are meant to be private graph. Um, you know, Twitter, I always like to say I'm not the sum of my tweets. I say a lot of silly things, and I don't think it showcases how I see myself in a 360-degree view. And so what we wanted to do was give everybody a very simple set of tools where they could make a page that would allow them to present themselves, right? And in a more holistic way. So a little bit about what you do professionally, uh, a little bit who you are as a person. Um, and to be able to show like a photograph of yourself, something that kind of really explains, you know, your esprit. And it turns out that that very simple idea resonates with a very massive, you know, audience. So our scale is, is starting to approach, you know, pretty, pretty mega scale. And um, that's it's exciting. So I think it's a big need. And so you've taken on the traditional paper resume. You, you think that that could be a thing of the past. Now, your next move is the business card, right? You guys just kind of launched a service that, you, I mean, how many of you guys here are passing out your business cards? Yeah, Some everyone. Folks, right? Um, if you're Stop like me, killing the trees. You, you lose your business cards all the time. So you want to fix that. What's the, what's the new well, announcement with that? Well, so, yeah, I, we definitely want to fix that. Um, the thing that we've been focused on since we, we, we took back about .me a year and a half ago was I realized that we had, we had a lot of users, but we didn't actually have engagement. And so what we've been trying to solve for is give people pragmatic, tactical things that they can do with their page that create value for them, right? So one of the things that you alluded to that we launched about a month and a half ago is we enable our users now to attach a resume um, to their about.me page, which we think is really powerful. Um, because for millennials or a lot of people that aren't in classical um, kind of professions, you know, a traditional resume doesn't really showcase that group of people very well, right? Your, 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 your personality is a big piece of that, especially when you're young and you don't have a lot to actually show on your resume. Um, the, the business card thing is an obvious thing for us to go do because, um, you know, it kind of blows me away. There's this, this, you all have the cards and I bet if I ask you to pull them all out, they all kind of look the same. You may think they don't look the same, but they actually do. There's really been relatively no innovation. Maybe fonts and paper stock in the last, you know, 75 years. <laughs> and so, you know, so the first thing we did was we enabled our users to actually make a physical business card um, that had their picture, right? The picture they use on their about.me page, and then on the back, a link to their about.me page, and then whatever information they wanted to give. And now the logical thing for us to go do is to turn that into a digital um, uh, format, which is what, you know, well, I don't have it here, but. Um, <laughs> so, so what that allows you to do in a digital format is not only share your contact information, but you can decide which contact information on the fly you want to share with somebody. I might be comfortable giving Matt my cell phone um, and my email and my about.me page. But you would give Lori a different but number? I get but the Lori, sterile <laughs> <business> card. <laughs> Lori, I don't want Lori texting me, you know, like, you know, it's for some scoop. <laughs> so I'm only going to give her my email address. And I can do that very elegantly on the fly. So the app is called Intro. Um, it's off to a crazy, crazy, crazy ass start. And I would hope that all of you would download it and give it a try here. And so if any of you meet Tony, make sure he gives you all his contact info. <laughs> now you know if you're not getting everything. So there it is. <laughs> Boom. You go find Tony and get his, get his contact from intro. And well, I mean, one thing you're touching on there is mobile and the power of mobile and how much it's kind of changed the game and changed our behavior. 
Um, I'd be interested, I mean, Matt, the DNA of WordPress is mm -hmm. kind of web-based. So mm -hmm. how are you guys dealing with the shift towards mobile? Yeah, it's, um, I would say that I think of our role as being quite critical there because as we've all seen, like a lot of the growth and weight in mobile has been on the app side. And WordPress, as you said, is about the web. I think that it's crucially important for the future of a free internet that the mobile web becomes a thing. And so it's something we work on a lot and something I think about a lot. Like how do we take the freedoms that made the web the most successful medium in human history and bring that to these app platforms where they're not open like the web yet. They don't have the same freedoms and capabilities. So uh, it's something I'm kind of obsessed with. <laughs> <laughs> Matt gets a little obsessive. <laughs> Just a bit. In, in part of, I mean, part of WordPress strategy when you talk about growth and kind of going forward, acquisitions, you mm -hmm. know, trying to build out the company. Um, I hear you have some acquisition news for us. Yeah, actually, um, we do. We, um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but actually the first ever company we acquired was in Ireland. There's a company called Pole Daddy up in Sligo. Is there any Sligo residents here? Maybe not? <laughs> it's okay, there's not that many there either. <laughs> and um, today we're announcing we actually acquired a company in the UK called Co for the People. Um, it's a six person company over there, and they'll be joining our VIP team. So this is something, again, with the raising of money, we're going to start looking at ways we can deploy it. And because Automatic is completely distributed, um, we're not just looking at companies in Silicon Valley or New York. We're really looking at companies all over the world and seeing, oh, this is one of my fundamental beliefs, the first principles. Um, the best people in the world uh, are all over. They don't, they're not clustered in just a few geographic areas. And so we, um, we've always, just like we hire everywhere, uh, we're very open to talking to companies anywhere. So I'm excited that the Code for the People team is going to be joining. If nothing else, then they have awesome accents. It's interesting that you say the best people are <laughs> around the world, right? Yeah. And, and part of your company culture is you have a distributed workforce. So whereas Facebook or Google, everybody's in you know, these uh, one office, your workforce is just all around, sometimes mm. not in an office. It's, it's, very, it's an interesting strategy. I mean, do you think, you know, why the idea of a distributed workforce? And do you think that's sustainable? I mean, I'm thinking Google's giving out free food, and then now <laughs> we're literally seeing these people one, oh, these companies one up each other, and the perks they're giving out. So is it is it sustainable? Um, the perks are probably sustainable. I mean, they get people to work more, they get people at the office more. But we try to think of it from a different point of view. So we try to hire people that are able to feed themselves <laughs> and don't mind doing their own laundry and things like this. They can get haircuts at normal places and give them just a ton of autonomy. So I think that's the future of the best and brightest in the world. It's not going to be about these sort of, these workplaces that kind of infantilize you a little bit, like by taking care of all the needs. It's going to be about, do you truly have freedom? Can you work when you want? Can you work where in the world you want? Um, can you, you know, take time off to go, like pick pumpkins, if, if that's the day that that's happening? Can you, whatever it is, like, um, do you truly have that freedom? And that's what the best and brightest are going to demand, and that's what we try to cater to. You know what I love about, so, so I've learned, um, being on Matt's board, I've learned about distributed workplaces. And so for both of my companies, Sphere and, yeah. and About.me, we also are a distributed uh, team. And I, I started off a bit skeptical, and I thought at different kind of vantage points that you would have to, you know, uh, bring everybody to a central location, location. What I love about it, the main thing that I love about it, for you and for us is that it's a meritocracy, right? Mm -hmm. You get, I think there's so much, um, your viewpoint of people gets so clouded in the interrela you know, the relationships that you have in an office around the water cooler, you know, mm -hmm. so to speak. And when you, when you divorce yourself from that, it's pretty binary. Does this person work well with the team or not? Does this mm -hmm. person um, deliver their code on time or not? Does this person do what they say or not? Uh, you know, and it really doesn't matter to us, I think, if they do it from 9 to 5 o'clock or if they do it from 7 o'clock in the evening until 4 in the morning. I really don't care. It's just very binary. Does it get done or not? And I think that creates a very healthy work environment. Um, and, and also the other thing I've learned about it is that um, the communication skills that get created within a culture are phenomenal, right? Because you learn how to use the tools. You use mm -hmm. Slack, you use IRC, you use these, these tools mm -hmm. where you have to be able to communicate with other people very effectively. It's, I think it's amazing. 
both of you guys kind of do some investing on your own. Uh, I remember, you know, you told me about smart things before I even really knew about, uh, about smart things. <laughs> What do you look for? And, and I know you get pitched all the time, um, and, and you probably get pitched all the time too. What do you look for in a, in a company you potentially put money into or invest in? Huh. Well, Tony's the professional here, so I'll let him answer this. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing I've learned to focus on over time is less the idea and more the quality of the founder. And I think it's a bit of a throwaway line. A lot of, a lot of venture capitalists or angel investors will say that. I think um, the angels actually probably do it better than the venture capitalists. I think we, get, we have a tendency to get caught up in the market size and the idea and all that. Um, so what I'm really curious is what somebody has done with the advantages or the disadvantages that have been presented to them. And that's really the thing that I want to anchor on. I don't care if you came from a Silver Spoon family or you came from a very you know, disadvantaged environment. You know, you've created opportunities for yourself or you've been presented them. What do you actually do with those, those things? Sure. And so I spend a lot of time over indexing on, um, you know, that journey that that person's been on. And I think it tells you a lot um, about kind of how they're going to evolve in the future, right? Um, and then, and then, I, and then I, I do look at the idea as a secondary level to make sure it's not crazy. But I've done some crazy stuff. You know, MakerBot was crazy, Fitbit's crazy, sure. you know, even WordPress probably in a lot of ways was crazy in the moment. And in the early days, yeah. It's one of those things that, for me, I just look for stuff that I would want to do if I wasn't doing automatic or like yeah. that. It's just such a fun idea, like smart things, like MakerBot. Um, it's not really, I mean, I would invest in like a lampshade maker if it was like a smart, connected, Internet of Things lampshade. Uh, so there's not really like a... a uh, area or any thesis like a real investor would have, but it is something that I've had to cut down on a lot like with this new role. So I've been trying to take a step back, but there honestly are more cool companies than ever before. Than ever before. Yeah. And um, and I, we had talked about this question before, Tony, but we know so much about what you guys do and what's on paper or I guess on your blog or on your about.me page, <laughs> not on paper. Um, What's not? I mean, what's not on your resume? What do, what do I not know about yet? Surprise me. Well, yeah, what you wouldn't know. So I, um, I grew up in a fairly, you know, kind of what I call, you know, humble, you know, not poor, but definitely a very normal, uh, small little farming community in Indiana. And so it didn't present a lot of advantages, um, for sure. Um, but the thing that I did get from that was um, an appreciation for work and for moving, taking control of my own kind of destiny and pushing forward. So I've done all kinds of odd jobs. I've been a janitor. I've been a little league umpire. I've worked <laughs> on a glue machine in a factory. Um, I have worked at the, the Dairy Queen. I've worked at a pharmacy. Um, uh, you know, I, I feel like I've, I've done a lot of different things. And those are things that classically wouldn't be on a resume, per se. But they're so fundamental to who I am as a person at this stage of my life. And I can see that now. I can connect that tissue back. And I understand how those help to form the person hopefully I'm becoming. Um, and so, you know, I think that's part of, once again, back to the magic of what an about.me page does, is it allows you to tap into that stuff that necess wouldn't necessarily show itself in a traditional resume or other places in the social web. Um, but it's fundamental stuff that's core to me. Working at Dairy Queen helped you <laughs> figure out who to invest in. How to, give, me, give me a specific. Tony. I worked at, I'm not sure that helped me, but I think uh, <laughs> work, I worked there for three weeks. It wasn't a success. Um, <laughs> you washed out at Dairy Queen? I washed out at Dairy Queen. Um, but, you know, I think it is humbling when you, you do get to work in a factory. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think... I think you learn a lot about empathy and, and um, you learn a lot about respect for humanity in sure. those kind of roles that, um, you know, if you just kind of zoom forward to this station in life, um, I think you could very quickly kind of, kind of forget and become a little inhumane, um, sure. to be honest. <laughs> Um, well, and, and Matt, I know we got to wrap up, but anything we should know that's not on your WordPress page? You, you literally blog food. I, when we're at a dinner or something, you were literally <laughs> posting the picture before you've taken the bite. So I don't know if there's anything we can't know. <laughs> I, but uh, I do share a lot. I'm a very open book. <laughs> but is there anything that we don't know? Well, there's some things I'm waiting for the Statue of Limitations to pass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anything else? I, I, I love home networking. So this is kind of like my secret hobby. So like friends, I'll go over to the house and like set up the Wi-Fi and do the whole networking thing. I'm really into like ubiquity hardware right now, enterprise Wi-Fi. So that's kind of my, my fun thing. If you ever need help with that, let me know. I, I mean, I'm gonna I, do lots of I will hit you up. So. I'm going to give you two things about Matt. 
<laughs> uh oh. One. Okay. One, he's a killer, killer jazz musician. And number two is he's an economics geek, wonk, whatever. <laughs> he really loves like economics. How's that? That's great. We got to wrap it there. Awesome. Thank you guys. Hey, thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>